أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأقر وجهك للدين حنيفا فطرة الله فطرة الله التي فطر الناس عليها لا تبدين لخلق الله ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون منيبين إليه واتقوه وأقيموا الصلاة ولا تكونوا من المشركين من الذين وإذا مس الناس ضر دعوا ربهم منيبين إليه ثم إذا أذاقهم منه رحمة ثم إذا أذاقهم منه رحمة إذا فريق For example, that all praise belongs to Allah to the level He deserves. 
But what is praise? What is alham? Something that we don't even, we take it for granted. We don't even care sometimes. Yeah, Allah deserves praise. What does that mean to me? Does it, can someone tell me another word for praise other than hamd in Arabic? Someone knows the word mud also means praise. What is the difference between the word hamd and mud? To compliment. To compliment. Also to praise. But what is the difference between the two? Tabatabai explains. He says, Alhamd is to praise someone for a good acquired of his own intention. Al Ahmad is, is more general. It is used to praise even that good which someone is given. For example, if you look at a pearl, the luster of a pearl, the beauty of a pearl, you don't say hum, you say mud. Because it wasn't something of its own. Allah gave it. Something else gave it this luster. So with that, Allah basically teaches us how to praise Him. What is this beginning of Surah Fatiha? Allah is teaching us, guiding us, showing us how we need to praise Him. So that if you look at the names of Allah in the Quran, like Bismillah Rahman Rahim, and if you look at the, the uh, what Allah says in Quran, Allah has the most beautiful names. His other, in chapter 20 verse 8, he, His are the very best of names. And Allah's are the best of names, therefore call on Him thereby, and leave those alone who violate the sanctity of His name. Forget about those people who violate the sanctity of His name. You praise Allah. You worship Allah. You remember Allah. It is clear that Allah is good. We know that from His names, from His actions, from what He's done for us. How do we get to know Allah? From this beautiful Quran. From His actions of His creation. It's hard for our limited minds to understand the greatness of how great He is, that we just talked about before. But if you look at, um, for example, chapter 42, verse 5, Allah says, And the angels declare His glory with praise of their Lord. So this is telling us that everything that's emanated in this world is glorifying Allah. And how do they glorify Allah? With His praise. There's another verse. Chapter 17, verse 44, the one I started with. And there is not a single thing but glorifies Him with His praise. So Allah is showing us that we need to praise Him the way He wants us to be praising Him. Some people say, what about Ahlul Bayt? What about the Prophet? When they praised Allah. Well, with them, since they are so pure, and they're, when they're the purified servants, we're talked about in Tathira, in the Quran. Tabatabai says he treats their utterance of praise as though he himself is saying it. As we know, when the Prophet said anything, it's Allah who inspired him and guided him to say those things, like the Quran. And when the Prophet was asked, he said, I do not enumerate thy praise. Thou art thou, thyself has praised thyself. So when you look at these divine words, Alhamdulillah, and keep remembering Allah for what He's given us, for having life, for being awake, from, from seeing the truth, we have to praise Him to the level He deserves. Alhamdulillah, come on, walk it. And when we say Alhamdulillah, it's a training for His servants. And a training which is only known by Allah how to guide us, to show us, to, to find Him. And so today, with that, I say Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. What I wanted to begin this next series of discussions is a, is a book by, first we know Al-Mizan. So we're going to start covering these parts of it. Because it's important to understand the Qur'an, the tafsir of Qur'an. And yes, it's deep, but we're going to take it to the level that we can understand it, to put it to practical. Everything should be practical, pragmatic. I don't know if knowledge is effective when it's just going in one year out the next. And why I take that as a worry is, we had the camps, and we came after the camps in Ramadan, and after Ramadan, Alhamdulillah, we get to see each other, but it was a, like a month gap. And actually, if you go from June to now, it's been three months. Some of us, we haven't seen each other. The risks are, when you're exposed to society, and I'm just speaking to two brothers I mean, covering kinesiology. They told me something interesting. I told them, you know, when I was a teenager, I used to work out, then I stopped for 25 years. They said, well, you know, if you stop for one month, your muscles become, like, what did you say, useless? Back to the original state. Which is so, if you've been working out for 25 years and you stop for one month, you go back for 25 years. You go back as if one month takes you back 25 years. What happens with Islam? 
the knowledge, the faith, if we stop, what's going to happen to us? If we stop improving, we stop working out our brains, our souls, we're going to go back for 25 years, right? Even worse, we're going to go back to the grave, and unfortunately, we'll go to the grave useless. We came from the dirt, we're going back to the dirt, and we're going to say, well, I gained knowledge for a little bit of time, but then I went back to my normal ways. And now, what are those normal ways? The society is so dangerous, my God. On Eid, I met some brothers at the gas station, and I talked about this, and it shook me till today. They were surrounded by young uh, girls from the community, from not from the Muslim community, but from the, the American Canadian community. And these guys are coming out of Eid, and they're spiritually enhanced, and these girls are jumping all over them. So now I said, now their desires are in trouble, because they're hungry, and they're spiritually they're hungry, but they're also, we're all human beings, right? And if they're not careful, they're going to do something wrong, and they're going to get in trouble, and they're going to have problems. So how do you build yourself stronger so that you, you're able to use your brain and say, okay, I'm going to go eat some food, but I won't eat something that's bad for me. I won't drink something that's bad for me. I won't do something that's wrong. We need to gain knowledge. And so the second book we're covering is by Ayatollah Mutahari called Man and Universe. It's a 600-page book, and we're not going to cover it in one month. Right? It's going to take a long time. But what we'll do is take pieces of his book, take pieces of Tafsir of Al-Mizan. I even read something very beautiful by uh, Mullah Sadr, which is a little bit too complicated for us to go on, a, you know, on an average talk. But he discusses his analysis of Kulaini's book on, uh, on the hadiths of the, of the Ahl Bayt, which is beautiful, and he talks about knowledge. And today our talk is about the philosophy of awareness, of knowledge, of faith, of desires, just to talk about what it, what it all is, because we have desires, we have wants, but are we animalistic? Are we like an angel? Are we satanic? What, what, is, what is, who are we? When we get to understand who we are, inshallah we'll be able to take the next step, because what happens? We talked about knowledge uh, in the summer. We gave the analogy of knowledge is like the light in a car. It helps you see. If you have no light, what's going to happen? You're going to crash it, right? Well, what is faith? It's that love. Of the, it's the engine of the car. So now you have the light. Now you have the faith. You need to move. Because if you don't turn on the engine, you don't start moving, then you're never going to get anywhere. And not, not only that, you need to go around the, the pitfalls. And the pitfalls of society are dangerous. Some of you started university already. What is happening? Yes, your friend is saying, come on, let's go for a drink. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's skip class. Let's go do this. It's a constant bombardment where you have to say, what is my priority? What's my goal? Where do I want to get? Some of you, alhamdulillah, you're on the right path. You're, you have no problems. You're flying. You're actually flying to Allah. Well, others like me, I'm drowning in the mud. And I need to come out. And you need to help me, inshallah. So we need to help each other. So the other important thing is when I looked at these brothers surrounded by their desires and the dangers of society, you know, it's like you see it in front of you, you say, my God, where are they going to go? <coughs> then do they, do they think that religion is important? Look at the world today. Does the world even think that religion is important? No. Most liberal-minded individuals on the earth today, they say this religion is old-fashioned nonsense. What is this? It's a waste of time. And this thinking has been going on for a while. If you think you live in a secular world, what is secular? Non-religious, just materialistic, forget about everything else. Just make money, get a job, get family, get children, die. This is, everybody's teaching us to go this way. Well, if you look at some of these so-called so secular, anyone can tell me who was the first prime minister of when India had the revolution? After the like Gandhi was the guy in charge, but who was the first prime minister? It's hard to remember that other sixty years ago, right? There's a guy named Nehru. You ever heard of that name? Nehru? Anyway, Nehru was a guy who was so secular. This is amazing. When you look at people, this is when you realize the reality. This guy was so secular, he was anti religion, he said, This is like inertia, this is like old fashioned nonsense, stagnant. We're not going anywhere with religion. What is this? It's a waste of time. When you come to the masjids, what happens to the youth? They feel the same thing. He said, I'm going back 1400 years when I go to the masjid. Everybody's so backward. 
And it's true. Unfortunately, in many respects, the way people behave in the masjids or in the religious environments, it's like going back 1400 years. Especially when they eat. They're not like, what's going on? They don't even know how to put a piece of napkin on their lap and eat with cleanliness. Food is flying all over the place, you know. Forget forks and spoons, you know, they grab it in Ramadan, we saw that, it's just like their desires are just taking over them. And they have no control of themselves. And ethics and manners is just not important. So what's funny is, when Nero was dying, he said something in his last days, he was very interested. He said, it's necessary and good to take advantage of moral and spiritual ways. He says, I've always agreed with Gandhi about this respect. I believe that it is more necessary to take advantage of these means for now than ever. We need moral and spiritual answers to the questions resulting from this moral vacuum caused in the modern culture, which is becoming popular. So he's dying and he's leaving this world. Now he's saying, I need morality, I need spirituality, I need something. Why? Because now they've lived their whole life. All about money, things, getting a husband, getting a wife, getting children, big house. And then they say, that's what life is about? There are people 70 years old and they say, I wasted my life. What did I do for 70 years? What am I going to do tomorrow when I'm in the grave? It's too late at that time. It's like you're entering the grave and it's too late. We as, uh, you know, maybe we're not that old yet, but if we're trying to wake up now, we need to wake up and see what the truth is. What is the light? So let's start with what Mutahari says. Mutahari says, what's the difference between animal and man? Anyone else? You said you read the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Muhammad? Uh, humans have free will, but animals don't have free will. That's not true. I'm going to tell you something that's not true. Animals do have free will. They're not robots. You know, they, they're just like us. We are animals, but maybe our level of intellect is different. Yes? Control over the desire. Okay. Control over the desire. Animals are eating and drinking and doing them. Some of them eat their own cubs, you know, that people do that too sometimes. Some of them eat their own, I don't even want to say, pigs eat their own crap, but okay. Some animals eat their own junk, yes. That's true. You said something interesting. Desires, aspirations. We have different levels as than animals. What do animals think about? Their environment. What am I going to eat? They're looking at what's in front of them. They're not thinking the past, oh, when I was small. They're not thinking the future. They're thinking now, the present. So Matahari begins to describe the differences between animals. And he mentions four things. Yes, you have something? Okay. He mentions four things, and he calls it the prison for animals. The prison. He says, one, their knowledge is superficial. Their desires are material, and they don't go beyond the limits of eating, drinking, sleeping, playing, mating, and building a home or a nest. Most human beings have become like that. That's their life. But for animals, that is their life. I mean, that's all. What does a bear want? If you ever go to the Niagara Falls and you get to go to a marine land, you see these bears. All they want to do is eat. It's sad because you feel like, my God, these poor bears, they have nothing. They just care about eating and eating, and that's it. Okay, that's one. That's one of the prisons. That's all they know is their surrounding and all that's satisfying their desires. Two, it's partial and particular and neither universal nor general. All their desires are personal, individualistic, or it's about helping their mate or their cubs, and that's it. That's it. They don't care about society. They don't care about the human beings. They don't care about the ants. It's just me, myself, and I, and my family, maybe, at some time, sometimes not, and that's it. A lot of human beings have become like that. Okay, number three. It's regional, confined to their environment, where they live. Okay, they're not looking about what's going on in China, they're looking about what's happening in my house, in my neighborhood, in my pond. Number four. It is limited to the present. It is unconcerned with the past or the future. We talked about that. An animal is not aware of its own world's history. Some people say, well, what about the elephant? He has the memory as any, you know, some people say an elephant can remember what happened to him when he was born till he's dead. Fine. That's his life. What about his history, prior or future? No. There's no clue. Animals don't think like that. 
It's neither even concerned about the future. From the viewpoint of knowledge, an animal cannot outcome the framework of its exteriors. It's just for the living environment, the present time never escapes these four prisons. Animal has to live with these limitations. This is an animal. What is humanity become? Go to that gas station and we see those brothers and there is just about satisfying your desires. Forget about my consequences, what's going to happen to me in the future. If I want to get married, what's going to happen with this, this, this other opposite gender? What is going to happen to the future? I need to satisfy my wants and desires now. Forget Ramadan is over now, it's Eid, I need to celebrate. Yes, there's a smart way to do things, a halal way. And the reality is most of us, we don't care. We just have, just going crazy and our wants are so... They're just taking over us. We have no control over, like you said, we have no control over our desires. People have become like that. Not animals. People have become like that. So, now let's talk about man. Man, they have knowledge. They have desires. Fine. But they are much more vast. It's not about what I want in front of me. They start thinking, okay, I want five years from now, I want to get my BMW. You know, they're thinking forward. They're thinking past. They want to look at, all right, I need to find my future wife. I'm not just going to grab the first, you know, lioness next to me. I'm going to grab the, I want to find the right one in the future. So their thinking is much more long-term, much more global. Their knowledge is much more. They are not only concerned about the exterior, but interior. They're thinking inside. They're thinking future. They're thinking, they're, look, they're thinking of the stars and the moon and the planets. Everybody's talking about, oh, there's a comet coming. You know, you heard about that, right? Everybody's scared. There's a comet coming very close, aligning with the earth, and they start panicking. And you know, they say 2012 and all this crazy stuff's going on. Everybody's worried. But look at their thinking. It's not just limited to their, you know, their environment. They're thinking way out in space. So if you look at man, they also have faith. And when they have faith, it's thinking about others. And they care about others. And they worry about others. And they're thinking about, constantly thinking of other things. So when we come to the conclusion, knowledge and faith constitute the main basic difference between man and animal, then they begin to realize what, what humanity, what, what we depend on. So we need to say, where do we go from here? This is important. Now I'm talking very, this time as I told you, I want to take, the, take us up a level. Because last year we were inspiring, we were illuminating, we were driving, we were action. But then what happens? It's like, you know, we're just talking. We have so much good action, but if you don't think, it's like going to the battlefield and you don't have the sword. Or you say, okay, I'm going to drive this car and you don't put gas in it and you're never going to move. You're not going to get anywhere. So we need to think, what is next? It's important that you guys know this is so important that you need to gain knowledge and don't get bored of this religion and think it's not important. Today we're going to talk about what makes our faith, our religion, knowledge, faith, what is so good about it, what's why and so forth. Why do you need it? Some of us say, well, I need to find a good wife, so I'd rather find it in my own community. Well, it's more than that. And I'm going to talk a little about what Tahiri tries to explain. And I know you, some of you have covered this, like William Durant. You've covered that in university. You've covered these philosophers and Spencer and all these guys. We're going to mention some of their good points and bad points, how they've guided us in the right or wrong way. So first, one other thing for us today. You ever see these old movies that supposedly take place in the 1700s? When Americans, the pilgrims first came to America, what was the biggest, toughest thing they went through? Their environment, nature. They had to conquer nature. They had to build roads and trees and the weather. and It occupied their whole life raising and growing food and they need to they need to eat they need to live 20 hour days just struggling building the farm what do we have today do you need to worry about growing grapes i go to the store buy grapes do you need to worry about eating no you just easily go to you don't even need to worry about cooking anymore you ask the sisters how many you know how to cook ask the brothers how many no one knows how to cook anymore oh we go to the chinese oh you know how to cook toast and tea <laughs> maybe you want know to make tea okay. that's good <laughs> So some of us know how to make frozen TV dinners. I don't even know if they eat TV dinners in the world, but yeah, you can heat up a meal or make macaroni. I don't know how to make macaroni. Where did you get it from? Yeah, you just mix the ingredients, you know, heat it up, it's done. Well, make it from scratch. 
in the old days, they didn't even have the, the dry macaroni. They needed to make the macaroni by scratch. We don't have that worry anymore. So now we're so ahead of the game. We don't have to worry about getting gasoline, oil, digging, none of that stuff. Yeah, some of us have jobs that we do that, but nature has been conquered. So now what's the future of man? We don't have to worry about these things as much. Yeah, in the future there's going to be struggles, but generally that's not the worry. So now, this, the great extent of what's, what's liberated us from captivity, our captivity has been nature, now we've been liberated. Now we don't have to worry about our animal tendencies or, or just our satisfy, satisfying our desires of conquering nature. That game is over. Now we have to go to the next level of our intellectual capability. We need to start thinking much higher. Now, am I confusing you guys yet? Okay, now look at this. I'm going to show you, from what Matari explains, of the Judeo-Christian thinking versus Islamic thinking, and why a lot of people are lost. So anybody who's read Genesis, the beginning of the Bible? Most people who ever read the Bible don't want to read the beginning of the school. Forget about it. <laughs> okay, it's true. In the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, which is like the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve, and all that stuff, compare that to what the Quran says. And what's amazing is, you know what the, the Bible tries to make you think? Yes? It tries to make you think that uh, knowledge is from the devil? Yes. Right. Excellent. So, knowledge is an evil thing, and the only way to get it is to disobey God, and then you get knowledge. Why do you say that? Okay, let's show you some, some verses from the Bible. Now, the Bible today is not what was given to Prophet Musa, to Prophet Isa. It's not. It's been changed. And I'm going to show you an example of that. Okay, the forbidden tree. We, heard, we always heard about that, right? And the forbidden tree in the book of Genesis, is, they talk about it's the tree of knowledge. It's not an apple. It's, they say the tree of knowledge, right? So if you go to chapter 2, 16 and 17, in the Bible it says, And thy Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. You could eat anything from this garden. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat it. Don't eat that tree. Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't touch it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, you shall surely die. This is the verse of the Bible. Just don't gain the, don't eat, go and eat from the tree of knowledge and gain knowledge because you're going to die if you do that. Okay, chapter 3, verse 1 and 7. Shaitan, they call it the serpent, and the serpent said to the woman, look what they do, they attack the woman, poor lady. Okay, Shaitan goes to the women. You shall not surely, you shall not surely for God doeth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened. And if you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So Shaitan is saying, look, you want to wake up and see reality? And you want to be like the gods, you know? This is Bible talking gods. I don't even know why I would say that. Okay. And you want to know good and evil? Go eat from this tree. Go and disobey God, then you will have knowledge. Look what it's saying. And in the same chapter, 20, 22 and 23, it says, And thy Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest you put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. So now, think about what the Bible is teaching you the majority of the world, which is say, another two billion plus people follow the Bible, right? Of the Judeo-Christian faith. According to the Bible, God wants man to be unaware of good and evil, according to the Bible. And the forbidden tree is a tree of knowledge. So the Bible is saying, don't get knowledge. Don't. Because this knowledge of good and evil is bad for you. Man maintains knowledge only if he rebels against God. So you will, for you to gain knowledge, you need to rebel against God. God's command and disobey all the teachings of God and the prophets and all that kind of stuff. But for the very reason, he is driven up from heaven because he went and gained knowledge. So do you see the teaching of the Judeo-Christian world, the Bible? If you want to gain knowledge, get the heck out of heaven. You're, you're away from God. Now what does the Quran teach? Yes, Muhammad. About Adam 
Yes. Uh, this is from the book? It's from the Quran. Uh, what does Allah teach Adam? Uh, Allah teaches him about his own nature. Okay, f uh, fantastic. You said it. Allah teaches Adam. What is the difference? Right there. Allah's telling Adam, I'm going to teach you the names of nature, about the reality. So right in the beginning, Allah says, I'm going to give you knowledge. Beautiful. Now look what the Quran says. It's contrast. Because on the basis of conception of evil, from the Bible, insinuations of, of getting knowledge is, is really... Ins the shaitan bothering you. If you want to get another, the shaitan bothering you. The Quran in contrast says that when you learn from the Quran, Allah taught Adam the names. Beautiful. The devil was commanded and he refused to prostrate to Allah. So he disobeyed God. So, what does the devil try to do for us? He tries to make us follow our greed, our selfishness, our desires, the, the, the exterior qual the animalistic qualities. Well, Allah. He's trying to show us the knowledge, the truth, the spirituality, what, what is a real human, the, angel, and the angelistic type of ideas. So, what is the difference? And this is amazing. The Quran is saying gain knowledge. Well, the Bible is saying don't. And if you don't gain knowledge, what's going to happen? You're going to be driving that car in the dark and you're going to crash. If you don't gain knowledge, that means you would never question Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Why would you question? Just believe, follow. This is what the Bible is trying to make people think. Don't question. Don't gain no. Don't understand. Just follow blindly. And then if that's the goal in life, what happens to the average European American? What is their goal in life? Very dangerous. So let's try to explain the difference between knowledge and faith for a second. Who can tell me the difference between knowledge and faith? What is knowledge? What is faith? Yes. Faith is something, faith is something which you really believe. Okay. You believe in it and knowledge something that you learn something and then you, you apply it yourself and then you teach others what you know. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Excellent. Let me give you like about five different versions of what's knowledge. Excellent. Knowledge gives us light and power. It's the, it's the ability to see the light as it shows you. Well, faith gives us love, hope, and warmth. Knowledge helps make and implement and appliances and accelerates progress. While faith determines the purpose for human beings' efforts and gives them direction. Knowledge brings about an outer revolution, while faith an inner revolution. Knowledge makes the world, man's world. Faith makes him life, the life of humanity. Knowledge expands the existence of man's horizons horizontally, while faith vertically. Faith reforms man, while knowledge trains man's temperament. Knowledge and faith both give power to man, but power given by faith is continuous, whereas power given by knowledge is disjointed. Knowledge is beauty, faith is beauty too, but knowledge beautifies reason and thought, faith <coughs> beautifies spirit and feeling. It's like faith is for your soul, your inside. Both knowledge and faith give man security, but knowledge provides an outer security, whereas faith provides an inner security. Knowledge gives protection against diseases, floods, earthquakes, storms, but faith provides security against restlessness, loneliness, a sense of insecurity or low thinking. Knowledge harmonizes the world with man, while faith harmonizes man with himself. So, as you know, both knowledge and faith have attracted some of the greatest thinkers. Now, what has happened to the world? I showed you what's one of the aspects of the Bible. And what happened from the Christian world in Europe? What happened to them? Or the Christian American Protestant world? What happened to us? What happened to us? And how are the Muslims being influenced? First of all, anybody heard of a guy named Alama Iqbal, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal? You know this guy, Iqbal? The poet. He says something interesting. First, he says we need spirituality. We need it. For, for sure, we need it. It will guide us, it will help us and all that. But then he starts talking about what is the idealism of Europe. What does Europe want? Okay, Europe, in America, in, because he lived, you know, there was a time where Europe was the superpower in the 18 and 1900s. So, for Europe, their goal is their perverted ego. 
the desires, the selfishness. They just want to, they're intolerant democracies. They don't care about the poor at all. They just want to help the rich. And this is, if you look at America, you look at what's happened this week about voting Palestine as a state. Everybody's scared because they're going to bother Israel who wants to say no. First of all, Palestine was a state before the UN started. Okay, the UN started in 1948 or something like that. They were a state. Okay, and the UN unfortunately was, you know, with the help of the US and Truman and all these guys, they, they started as real state. Fine, but give them their rights, guys. Come on. Well, what has happened? People are scared. They just care about the rich, the powerful, the guys with the money. The Palestinians are poor. Who cares about that? Come on. Look what's happened to the world. So the Muslims, on the other hand, what do we have? We have in our hands the possession of the ultimate revelation of God. We have the truth. And we can change the world, inspire and guide and the knowledge and the, the power of the... Look at these two things of the Bible against the Quran. Look at the difference. The Quran is saying that God will give us knowledge and guide. Knowledge is important. And the danger is disobedience to God and the desires, the animalistic desires, the ego. Well, the Bible is saying knowledge is bad. Look at that, how small of a little point, how the Quran just blows away the world. Simple. Now we're looking at the world and saying, where are we going? And so you look at these guys, and you look at these brothers and sisters who are in this society, their desires are just all over the place. And they've been taught in school, and every time they watch a television show, everything they see is satisfy those desires. Who cares? We talked about this, the music industry and like what Lady God was singing today. She doesn't, you know what she's saying? Just do what you want. Just who cares? Satisfy your desires. Don't even think about it. So the environment, society says, I don't care if I step on your toes. I need to satisfy my desire. I, want, I need to get what I want. And so this is dangerous. So William Durant, Will Durant, you heard of this guy before? Okay. He was a, a guy who wrote a book called The History of Civilization. It was popular like maybe 70 years ago. Anyway. He's, he wasn't a religious person. He wasn't, but he was an intellect. And he said, the ancient world differed from the new machine of the world only in means and not in aims. What will you say if you found that all the progress that consists in the improvement of the methods and not in the means? Okay, what is he saying? This sounds like, okay, another boring philosophy, boring class in university. I'm wasting my time. What is he saying? Go back to the ancient world of today, we're living in the 21st century, what's the difference? Only difference is we have improved the methods of gaining things. Our aims are still the same, greed, selfishness, and the wrong aims. The only difference between now and then is only the, the, the knowledge, the technology, everything else is the same. We're still backward. We're still living in old times mentally because it's all about satisfying your desires, or nature, conquering, eating, satisfying just all these pleasures of the outer body, and not even thinking about the future. Torture, massacre, who cares? Kill people just so you get what you want. This is the world the way it was thousands of years ago. We haven't changed. The only thing that's changed is the methods, the, 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 the knowledge. Now we can, instead of shooting an arrow at someone, we'll just drop a nuclear bomb on them. We don't care. So this is the way the world has changed. Only on the way we're doing things. The aim is the same. And then what he says, and this was interesting, what will you say if, about this problem? And he says, it is not the betterment of the aims or the goals. He's saying wealth is boring, wisdom is cold and boring, it's just a cold. It's, what is this wealth and wisdom? It's useless. He says, it is only love which which brings tenderness and warmness to the heart that will save the world. He said, it's the one who realizes the existence of this vacuum, this problem in the world. And he says, for him, who's not religious, what's going to satisfy this vacuum in us? We have this vacuum in us. We are a feeling of emptiness. You go to school, what grade are you, brother? Eighth. Eighth. Go to school, everybody's, you're in between the age of 13, 14, everybody's talking about dating and music and satisfies your know, desires, and then they're unhappy. And as I told you about that brother, who's an American guy who just ran away from home, they're just so unhappy. They have a, just an emptiness inside them. This Will Durant says the way to satisfy the emptiness is art and literature and philosophy. Okay, 
Fine. But he's also saying there's a guy named Spencer. And this is the problem of the world. Everything has become mechanical. What do they teach in school? Science. All mechanical. Forget about the inner feeling, the spiritual. Forget about that. No, they ever teach the university spirit? Spirit at all? No. Oh, the spirit of my university. <laughs> Who cares about that? They never talk about the spirit of ourselves, ourselves, the faith. Never. Everything is very mechanical. You're living in a, a mechanical world, money. It's, it's just driving us. Okay. Let me start saying what the problem was. He said about Spencer. He said, Spencer just said, forget about art and music and all the stuff. Just think about science. And if you look at what did that, what did that create? A bunch of robots in the world. And he said, if the world would have been much better if these guys didn't bring their philosophies to us. Because now we're all become mechanical. We work, eat, drink, and just die. That's all we've become. Robots. We're totally mind controlled, and you watch all these YouTube videos, all the Muslim channels, what are they trying to show you? Stop being controlled by the media, stop being brainwashed, wake up already. But the problem is we've all been taught, just gain knowledge, get a job, have a family, eat, drink, and die. That's all life is about. Forget about everybody else. Somalia? Where is that? All of those guys, the pirates that have been stealing our stuff, some people say it's good for them. I told you last year when this earthquake in uh, Japan, you know what some of the kids were saying? Oh, what's next? Tsunami, earthquake, now Godzilla is coming. You know, they say, what's, people don't care. They just don't have a passion for somebody else. Now there's others who care, who, are, who cry. That's what makes humans different from animals. When you hear a child being tortured without having any food or water, now you cry. Now you're a human when you feel that. So, can knowledge take the place of faith? Do you need both? Is one enough? Look at Europe today. They have knowledge. They have no spirit. Look at America. They have the knowledge. They have the technology, but they have no spirit. What has happened to them? They've become these blood-sucking monsters, vampires, and everybody's talking about new moon nonsense. This is where the world has become become vampires and eat and drink blood and have love and passion and just for the satisfaction of desires and the world is your place to take conquer. And what happens if you think like that? It's become destructive. Look at the empires are crumbling. Look at the empires. The greatest empires of the world are crumbling because they're borrowing and satisfying their desires of wealth. I want another car. Okay, I don't have money. Borrow. I want another bridge. Borrow. I want another you know, White House improvements. I need to, you know, they spent a million dollars for Rode, Rodeo Way, I think in uh, Bel Air, you know, in California, Hollywood, just to improve the roads. Well, that's the richest part of the United States. They, they got a million dollar grant from your government. Spend that money. What am I going to do with the money? The roads are fine. Ah, who cares? Spend, break them, grow, and make, make, make it again. Just care about stupidity. Where there's children in Africa and Somalia who are dying without food and water. And you can't even get in there. And you can't. If you try, you have to have bribe your way in. Again, satisfy the rich. And then you get the poor and they're dead by the time you get there. First all the money is gone and then you build a well and it's too late. Well, we have to try anyway. You try from the outskirts of Kenya and you try to build and you try to do good. Okay, can knowledge take the place of faith now? Knowledge cannot take the place of faith because one is, as I told you, the light and the other is the love of the engine that makes you move. Faith elevates our desires in addition to helping and realizing the aims and objectives of life. Besides that, it's our tools. Both of, our, both of them are tools to get nearer to Allah. Some people say, well, isn't knowledge a means then? Yes. <coughs> your knowledge is a means. What is your goal in life? Car, what you go to like? This is what this is Mullah Sadr talks about it. It's a little deep. He said, knowledge is your means, and then what's your final goal? Reach to reach Allah, to get to know Allah, to be one with Allah. Right? To get to be knowledgeable and near to Allah. So you know him. So knowledge is your means and your goal. So you need both. You ever look at those people when they pray, this the, the Arabs? Oh Allah, I just want to know you. 
when the Prophet reached the highest level, even past Jibra'il, he just got to know Allah even more than us. Yes, he's finite, he's a creation. But so the goal is also, you know, the means to get there. They're just different levels. So it's like you started your engine, your car, you're moving now in this direction toward God. And you need both. The religious faith is important that it guides you and it converts a man to become a true believer. It, it can suppress the selfishness of humanity. That's what faith does to us. So I look at, say, you American here who have no faith. Their selfishness and their greediness is killing them and it's destroying the economy. And it's destroying the world because it's all capitalism. Me, myself, and I, and I don't care about the world. But well, we need to start thinking past that. Because religious tendencies impel man, this is the importance of religion. It impels man to think of other than himself. Selfishness, if you're only about, about yourself, forget about faith. When you think of an idealistic idea, it's just a fantasy. I'm going to give my money to the children of Africa? Forget them. Why should I throw away my, my money? That's how people think. Because they're not thinking about Allah, or Allah's benefits towards us. So, it's all material. So, another psychologist named William James, he's, the outcome, what he was saying is religious faith is a sort of friendly relationship between man and the world. And the words are sort of harmony between man and the universal ideas. But selfishness, if you think only about yourself, it's so tragic. It's so egotistical. It's just going to destroy. And any idea of an ideal world is just a fantasy. You're never going to implement it because it's going against who you really, you really want. And there's another psychologist whose name is Eric Fromm. And this is funny because you look at most of these European guys, don't they, like, aren't they atheists? Or what, what, not they believe in nothing? Look what he says. He said that we are in need of praising something. We are in need of it. And I started by saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen in the beginning, right? This man is saying, our souls, our bodies, our mind, we're in need of it so badly. We need to adore something. We need to love something. Something greater than us. And this is, these, all these guys are psychologists and philosophers, and they're telling us, and they're not even Muslim, they're saying, there's a need in us. And Allah's telling you, praise Him. But when you satisfy that desire of your soul that you're praising Him, now you've reached a higher level of your existence. Because now you don't care about yourself anymore. It's not about praising myself, you're praising something greater than you who made you. That we can't even understand Him. Because we're so finite and so infinite. Then, actually, he continued. And he started talking about everybody has a religion. And the only way you can really figure that out is you need to start contemplating and figuring that and thinking and using your knowledge and get your faith inspired. And so, the man, as a man is in need of an ideal and faith, by his intrinsic, seek something which he can praise. The only way to open this, this, this thing up for us is religious faith. You think an atheist has that? What does he praise? Himself. Maybe his mama. But that's it. What do we praise? Something who made his mother and himself. The one who's the most infinite, the greatest, who's given us this ability to think. Look, I'm trying for us to start thinking in a higher level. It's kind of, it's sometimes boring to think more than just what's around us. But let's start going up a level. And let's start thinking about the, the greatness of this world, the universe. Let's look what the Quran says. The sister was reading something very beautiful. Surah Rum. She said, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطْرَ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهَا That was the first thing she read. Surah Rum, verse 30. Be devoted to the upright religion. That is the nature in which Allah has created man. Allah is telling us, He's put it in our nature to go toward Him, to the greatest of religions. Forget this. Look at this example I told you about Christian faith. How incorrect their philosophy and thinking was. Look, they're my brothers and sisters, and you're all of ours. And we need to help each other. Now even some of the Muslims are extremists and lost. We need to have a clear road. We don't want to be in all these potholes and falling in the wrong direction. 
We want to see the truth, the right, and that's only with in the deen, in the life of Islam. Surely the religion of God is submission to Him. And that's what Islam has taught us. Another ayat of the Quran, chapter 3, verse 83. Do not seek anything other than the religion of Allah. Afaghayra deen Allahi yabguna walahu aslama min fi samawati wal arud. But he who submits, but to him who submits everything that's in the heavens and the earth. So everything in the heavens and earth submits to God. Even the rocks, the pebbles, and the birds. So Allah is telling us, come to me. Praise me. Find me. Why are we blind? Wake up, he's saying. Now, some of us say, look, I'm wasting my time. Religion is a burden. It makes me waste my time coming to masjid. I have to go pray five times a day. I need to, you know, help others. And I need to help clean. I need to care. And, you know, I need to take time off for myself to sacrifice for others. Why? Why should I do that? Why do I need to go to masjid and recite Quran and gain knowledge and help and care? Why? Why should I worry about someone else? What's the use? A lot of us think like that. Especially when we come to the, you know, the Western world. We broke away from... Uh, uh, egalitarian thinking of you know, so, uh, social thinking, and now we're thinking more, you know, like selfishness. So look what the effects of faith are. One, faith is a thing, and this is a, is a Russian writer who said this. His name is Tolstoy. He said, "Faith is a thing in which people live. It inspires them to live. They want to live because if your life is only purely material and you don't have it, what are you going to do?" What's happening to the world? People come back from Iraq, everybody's committing suicide. Go to Europe. Go to the, the richest countries in Europe. As I told you, Switzerland, Finland, Norway. The highest rates of Switzerland, the highest rates of uh, suicide on earth are in the richest countries of the world. People don't care anymore. This is material is not helping me. I'm sad, I'm depressed. What does religion do for you? It gives you mental satisfaction. Man by nature seeks success for the very idea of achieving the light of the heart. Religion does that. Now when you do have put effort, you feel like, okay, it's going to be counted. There is someone greater than me watching me. I need to be pleasing to my Lord. You're sad, even when you're struggling with the suffering of, say, Palestine today, you have, you have faith. You say, you know what? I know they're suffering, but I have hope. And that hope is a lot. Imam Jabir Sadiq was meeting an atheist. And the atheist is saying, you know, I don't believe in God. And he says, are you a fisherman? He says, yes. Maybe you smell like fish, but okay. Yes. How did he know that? He says, well, were you ever on a ship? And were you ever drowning? And you ever, you know, and scared? He said, yes. And he says, what happened? Why did you still try? He said, I had a hole. I had to hold down and I had a hole. He said, that hope is Allah. That's what Allah is. That's who Allah is. He's our hope. So when you look at the tragedies of the world, he says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim. Allah is just, and we're going back to Allah, and I have hope and faith in Him. Now we have pleasure. And we have two types of spiritual pleasure. You know, we have the physical, the five senses. The five senses, you satisfy your mouth by tasting food, touching, you know, we satisfy those desires. What about the spiritual? That you only get from faith, from religion. You don't get it from anywhere. Okay, you read a book. Yeah, nice. You don't get much out of it, right? What, what happens next? Look what Allah shows us by respecting each other. You feel good. When you give charity, ask anyone who's given charity. And for When no one was looking, and you saw someone in need and you helped them, and that person had the greatest smile. Even that person maybe didn't know who it came from. But the feeling you had, the inner tranquility, the spiritual faith that, that satisfied your desires and your soul, that's beautiful. Now, the other thing faith does for us is this beautiful brotherhood and sisterhood that we have in Islam. You don't get that anywhere. The social relationships that we get, you cannot find that in, maybe you find it in some animals, the bees. Actually we had a bee coming in our house, we couldn't get it out, and then his friend came in and to help him, and oh my god, all these bees are coming <laughs> in the house. You know, this poor brother tried to get it out, but it didn't work. My wife had to do it, she's not scared. Anyway, so if you look at bees, they are very social beings. They build houses together, you know, and they, they work for the mother bee, and you know, it's nice. So the mother helped get the bee out, but okay. So, 
They're one of the few animals in the world who are social, but it's in instinctual. It's not that they want to. They don't feel that satisfaction of spiritual desires. They've been taught by God to work together, busy bees, to make honey and honeycomb and all this nice stuff. But that's all instinctual. Humanity is such a social person. Why do you like coming here? You know, I get nice pizza, maybe, you know, food, maybe get a little bit of getting away from home. It's kind of boring. But the other aspect is the social relationship with Islam, you know, the brotherhood, the love. That you would, you would die for your brother, cry for your brother, help your sister. You know, it's such a nice feeling. Now, this is what religion and the faith and the brotherhood, that, that, that the social relationship that we get from, from this. It shows friendly feelings to each other, and we consider justice. Look at that. We don't even know where Palestine is, some of us. Wasn't that Israel? No. no. Palestine is that little Gaza Strip in the West Bank, these two little pieces of property. That's Palestine. We're thousands of miles away, and we care about those brothers and sisters. Forget about that. There's children suffering anywhere in the world, in Congo. We care for them. What gives you that? Some people say, I'm humanitarian. Well, yeah, a lot of humanitarians care, but they need to publicize their names all the time. What happened to that, you know? It's self-glorification, yeah. You know, what's his name? Warren Buffett, give $40 billion away. Well, his name is not all over the place. Bill Gates' name, at least they're doing something, as we said, but it's, again, self-glorification, name calling, you know. Bahlul one day saw these guys making a masjid and he put his name on it. He says, well, you're building this masjid for a lot, right? So, well, who cares what names? No, 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 get out of here. And they hit him and they got in trouble or something. We have to break away from the selfish ego nonsense and say, no, we need to care for others. And faith does that for us. It is religious faith alone which respects truth, honors justice, encourages kindness, mutual confidence. We care about piety, we acknowledge moral values. When someone is nice and caring and loving, like even, you know, we, said, we talk about Gandhi. This guy wasn't he a Hindu, but yeah, he was a humanitarian. He cared for people. We respect that. Even uh, Mother Teresa, we talked about that last year. We cared for what she did. We talk about Malcolm X, we talk about Martin Luther King. Anybody who stood for justice, we care for them. We're happy. We're encouraging. We want to be like them. This is only that the faith can do for you. So those brothers and sisters who are just crazy for their desires, they don't realize they need to work on building the stronger faith. And they need to gain knowledge to understand and see. Because they don't realize that if they just worry about satisfying their desires, they're in trouble. And they may eat something or do something wrong, and it'll be in danger. Now, most of the greatest people I talked about, what, what did Mother Teresa, well, who was she? She was a Christian, trying to do good in this world. Martin Luther King was a Christian, trying to do good in this world. Malcolm X, a Muslim, trying to do good in this world. Gandhi, a Hindu, trying to do... The greatest people were all religious-based. They're trying to do good by faith. And look at the grace of all humanity. The Prophet, peace be upon him, Allah, Allah, Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain, who died for us, was butchered for us, that we can have this faith, the religion. Imam Jafar Sadiq, today actually is his, is his death, the, the anniversary of his death, that they poisoned him, Mansur poisoned him, because he was the man of truth, who spread knowledge, and today we're dedicating this, uh, this lecture, discussion of gaining knowledge to our Imam. Because if it wasn't for our Imam, who they left alone for a while, because the Abbasids were taking over over the Umayyads, and they left the father, Imam Bakr, a few, not forever, but for a little while. Imam Jafar said they had at least 4,000 scholars under him who helped guide us to the knowledge we have today. We have science today because of al Bayt's teaching, which they got from the Prophet, which came from Allah. We are so blessed for these great men that live for us, we need to give back and say, you know, we need to gain knowledge now. Yes, satisfying our desires, we want to do good, now let's do it right. At the camp we did a lot of good, now let's do things right. We're spiritually dead sometimes. We need to wake up and understand why we need to pray Salat al-Layl and Salat al-Fajr. I mean, we don't even wake up for prayers. You know what Imam Jafar Sadiq said before he died? And this is so important for us to wake up intellectually and spiritually. Before he died, there was a, some people came to him 
And he says, our intercession, our help cannot touch those guys who take prayers lightly. Surah Ma'un talks about that. Allah din hum salatihim. Those who take prayers lightly. Those who guys who do it to show off. Imam Jafar said, we can't even help those guys. He's not talking about the guys who don't pray. They're in a different category. Totally different. They're in trouble. He's talking about the Muslims who take prayers lightly. That we don't wake up a fajr. We don't even want to acknowledge God's greatness and praise Him and say, Alhamdulillah. We're in trouble, brothers and sisters. So let's wake up and satisfy our desires in an Islamic way, gain knowledge, build our faith, that we could be good representatives of Imam Jawa Sadiq today, that we could be the helpers of Imam Mahdi when he reappears to us. He's waiting for us to be ready and knowledgeable and successful in this world, to open the roads for goodness, to help the children of Somalia. One sister came to me just now and saying, I know we raised, you know how much they raised in um, Camp Taha for Somalia? Almost $100,000, you know that? They're sending $100,000 to the children of Somalia. Who did that? The youth, the people, not the camp. It's the people who gave money and said, let's help these children in Africa. We're eating, we need to help others. This sister came and gave. We need to help others. We're thinking for others. That's what faith is. That's what knowledge is. That's what the teaching of Ahmed Bayt are. Salawat. Allah. Salawat.